Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Amanullah Sand. I facilitate virtual programs at Teacher Development Webinars. I welcome you all at Teacher Development Webinars. Teacher Development Webinars is a social action project implemented by British Council Active Citizens in Pakistan as a response to COVID-19 crisis. It is an initiative to support teachers and educators around the world with professional development opportunities. We are thankful to Master English Training for sponsoring a Zoom account. And for uh, today's webinar, we'll be focusing on moves and steps writers could follow as they craft each part of a research article. We'll provide tips to help academic writers to present their information more effectively and publish in quality academic journals. And now it's my player to introduce Dr. Fong Tang for this webinar. Dr. Fong Tang, PhD, is an associate professor in applied linguistics at the Language Institute of Tamas University, where he currently serves as director. He's also the current president of Thailand Peaceful Association and serves on a review, a review boards of several ELT related journals. He earned a PhD in English studies from the University of Nottingham, UK. With over 30 years of teaching experience, he specializes in a wide range of areas in his teaching, including academic writing, written business communication, English for specific purposes, and career related English skills. He has conducted several teacher trainings in Thai context. His research interests and specializations involve second language writing, written discourse analysis, ESP and ELF. He compiled textbooks on English for health sciences, English for sociology and anthropology, and business writing for international communication. We are very happy to have you, Dr. Tang. Welcome to Future Development Webinar. Dr. Tang, good afternoon. So I'm going to share, right? Great. Can you see it? Yep. You need to maximize it. Okay. Great. Okay. So uh, good afternoon from Bangkok, Thailand. So I'm Supong Tang King Siri Sin. Okay, I'm the director of the Language Institute of Thomasat University. And I'm now the president of Thailand TESO Association. So today, right, it's a good opportunity, right, for me to share with you some ideas, okay, about writing. So, you know, we need to write a research article, okay, for publication as a requirement, okay, for teachers and university lecturers, right? Or sometimes, you know, we need to publish, okay, for our academic promotion. So today I would like to uh, share with you some information about, you know, how we should write a research article in humanities and social sciences. And the approach that I'm going to talk about is a genre-based approach. Okay, so let me start my talk now. So first of all, okay, because, you know, I'm referring to the genre-based approach, so I want to talk about the generic identity first. What, what is genre, right? So that means, you know, negotiating text depends in part on identifying ways in which a particular text is similar or to uh, reminiscent of uh, other texts circulating in the culture. That means, you know, when we produce a text, okay, it's not just uh, writing one way, but that means it's a kind of negotiating the meaning. So that means, you know, when we produce a text, we need to follow uh, a certain convention. Okay, so, you know, when we write a research article, Right, we need to also follow okay, certain steps right, in the convention of research writing. So if a text is not easily attributable to a genre, then it can be a problematic text. That means because you know, we have uh, the framework okay, for writing any kind of text. Okay? So that means you know, when we write a text, we should know okay, what the convention is, what genre it refers to or it belongs to. So next, right, I'm going to talk about the schematic structure of uh, a genre. So as we habitualize, 
our joint negotiation of communicative tasks, we establish a series of stages or steps. Together, these are known as the schematic structure of a tongler. Okay, so that means, you know, uh, they are a series of stages or steps that we should follow, okay, when we produce any communicative task. Writing is a kind of communication, okay, so it's more like, you know, two-way, all right, even though there might not be a uh, face-to-face interaction or, you know, real-time interaction, but it's more like, you know, communication. So that means, you know, we need to know the schematic structure of each genre. So schematic structure represents the positive contribution genre makes to a text which is a way of getting from A to B in the way a given culture accomplishes whatever the genre in question is functioning to do in a culture. So you see that any kind of text, you know, performs a particular function, all right? It has a real function, you know, in communication in society. Okay, so moving from one step to another, moving from A to B, okay, in a particular culture, this is, you know, what we need to be aware of. Now, another two, uh, issues that I would like to highlight here are constituency and labeling. So constituency, right, and labeling are important concepts for understanding, you know, how uh, genre, okay, are produced, okay, are structured, all right. So what is constituency here? That means, you know, when we identify the parts of constituents, okay, the of the text, right, that make up or constitute the whole text. That means you know, we need to know what the components you know, of each text are, what elements okay, uh, each text consists of. And functional labeling, right? this is another part. So functional criteria, which means you know, dividing the genre into different stages according to the function of the different constituents. So that means each text you know, consists of different constituents, right? and then each constituent performs a particular function. Okay, so you know when we divide okay the whole text into different parts into different stages, then we should know what each stage does. Okay, what the function of each stage is. Another uh, important idea here is the realization or rhetorical patterns. So usually realization patterns differ across genres. I mean, you know when we produce different types of text, okay, they follow different conventions they follow different schematic structures. So that like, uh, for example, you know, when we write a research uh, article, right? We follow a certain convention. When we want to write a business email, we follow another convention. When doctors have to write medical reports or some engineers have to write technical reports, okay, they follow, okay, certain patterns or conventions, you know, of the writing. And realization patterns also differ across schematic sta stages. That means the stages or the, uh, steps, okay, or sometimes, you know, we can call them moves, all right, these also vary or differ across, you know, the stages, you know, for each text type as well. So each stage of schematic structure is associated clearly with a number of grammatical and lexical features. So that means, you know, in each part, in each stage of uh, the tongue, right, there are certain grammatical and lexical features that we normally use, okay, to convey the meaning, right, for that particular text for a particular purpose. So there are two concepts here, which are important, right, stages and boundaries. For, for a research article, right, usually the schematic structure of a research article consists of the first part, which is the most important part here, right, which is the abstract. Okay, this is very common. That means, you know, when you read a research article, the first part of the article that you would expect to find, right, is an abstract. And then introduction. Next is literature review. Then research methods. Then the results section. Then the discussion section. And finally, the conclusion. Okay, so if you're familiar, you know, with uh, this schematic structure of a research article, then you would expect, you know, to see or find, you know, all these uh, sections or stages, right, you know, in a research article. So now let me start uh, with, you know, the first part of a research article, the abstract. What are the functions of an abstract? Actually, an abstract is a very important part, you know, when we want to write a research article, particularly for publication. So we normally use an abstract, you know, as a planning tool written before the paper, okay? So that, you know, we know what our paper will be 
about, right? And an abstract can be used as a synopsis or a summary for the whole research article. It can also be used as a preview preceding a paper in a journal so that the reader, you know, when they read uh, the abstract, they know what the paper is about, whether the paper is interesting enough for them, you know, to keep on reading. An abstract can be used as an application for a place at a conference if you want to uh, give a presentation, right, you know, in a, an academic conference. All right, so you have to submit an abstract, okay, for application. And an abstract can also serve as a stand-in for the full paper. That means, you know, a reader may understand a full paper briefly, okay, through the reading of the abstract. So now let's, uh, let me walk you through, all right, the different moves or stages, you know, for writing an abstract. Sometimes, you know, uh, the word stage can be replaced with the word move, okay? So that, you know, move one, okay, which is the orientation or locating the research article, right? Research study, okay, within the field or wider context, okay? So for example, you know, when we start off, you know, with something very general, like, you know, computers are now a fact of primary school life, okay? This is something very general when we locate the research study, okay? And the second move is the rationale, right? Where we create a niche, you know, for the research. Okay, so the example, an example here is like, you know, but there is a need for research on how to use them effectively. All right, so that means, you know, after, you know, we locate the research study within a wider context, then we move on, you know, to a more specific part, okay? And then move three in the abstract, right, which is the aim or providing the aim for or purpose of the research. Okay, this is an example. All right, so you can see, you know, some key words here. And the first intentional you know, may serve as, you know, the topic sentence or the main uh, statement, right? Like the paper investigate the use of computers in classrooms as a support for collaborative learning within a sociocultural pedagogic framework. Okay, so uh, this statement, right, uh, present, you know, the main purpose, you know, of the research. And then the following sentences may talk about uh, the hypothesis or, you know, something else relating to the study. And then move four, which is the methods, okay, which is the outlining of the research methodology or theoretical framework. Okay, this is an example. Okay, so, you know, when we present the methods, all right, we say something like these hypotheses are explored through the development and evaluation of an educational intervention program, decide to coach reason, reasoning to talk. Okay, so that means, you know, we explain, okay, how we conduct the research. Right. We just outline this, you know, in the abstract so that the reader would understand roughly, okay, what has been done, okay, in the research study. And then for move five, okay, we present the findings briefly. So here, you know, we outline the research findings. For example, we say like evaluation shows a mark, market improvement in the quality of uh, children's talk at the computer and also in of computer tasks designed to provide a measure of group reasoning, right, and so on. So here, you know, we present, you know, the main findings derived, you know, from data analysis. And move six, you know, which is the interpretation. So giving the general significance of the research findings. So you can say something like, you know, the results are evidence of the educational values of coaching, reasoning through talk, and suggest a practical approach to the use of computer in primary school. This is kind of, you know, the interpretation of uh, the major research findings. What do the results mean? And this is, you know, an example, you know, for the whole uh, abstract, okay, uh, which you can read maybe later, okay? And you can see the different parts or actually different stages or modes, you know, of an abstract. And you can also see the linguistic features, right? The different uh, keywords that we can use, you know, to present different parts, you know, in this abstract. Now, we move on to the introduction. Okay, so introduction uh, perform different duties, okay, different functions. Okay, so first, you know, an introduction, you know, can lead the reader from a general subject area to a particular field of research. Right, and then it establishes the context and significance of the research. It also summarizes current understanding and background information about a topic. 
It also states the purpose of the work in the form of the research problem, okay, supported by the hypothesis or research questions. And finally, it highlights the potential outcomes your study can review. So these are the five major functions you know, of an introduction. So that means you know, when we write the introduction, make sure that you know, we include all, right, all these topics. Okay, so now when we write the introduction then, all right, we should uh, start off, you know, with the opening paragraphs. So that, you know, the opening paragraphs of our paper, right, will provide our readers with, okay, different pieces of information, like, okay. So first, you know, that initial impressions about the logic of your argument. Okay, what is the main argument that you want to present? Okay, you should include that okay clearly you know in the introduction and then you should also show your writing style and of course the writing style here is academic writing style all right and the overall quality of your research this is you know what you need to also reveal okay in, right into introduction and the validity of your findings and conclusion this is something you need to introduce as well right into introduction okay so let's take a look at some example, all right? So, you know, when you say something vague, so a vague or disorganized or error field introduction will create a negative impression. So of course, you know, we need to make sure that, you know, when we write the introduction, all right, uh, we should, you know, write a concise, engaging and well-written introduction which will lead your readers to think highly of your analytical skills, okay, your writing style and your research approach. Okay, so make sure that introduction, right, that we write is not too long and is engaging or attractive, okay, and is well-written, well-presented. Now let's take a look at, you know, the example, right, for introduction. So the first move or the first stage, you know, for introduction is establishing a territory. Actually, you know, this is some uh, Chandra-based model, okay, uh, introduced or proposed, you know, by a very famous uh, researcher, right, named John Swell, Professor John Swell. Okay, so this is, you know, the uh, move analytical framework, okay, proposed by him. So the first move is establishing a territory. And under each move, right, there are several steps. So step one here is claiming significance. That means here we should show that the general research area is important, central, interesting, or re relevant, you know, to the research study. This is an example, okay? So, you know, when you start off, for example, you know, with the introduction to the uh, main topic, right, the computers, for example, computers are becoming an established part of education in schools throughout the developed world. But then, however, Okay, uh, sorry. However, despite, okay, sorry, I cannot see. Okay, so that means, you know, after you provide, you know, the general information about uh, the main point then, all right, you should focus on the central idea, all right? So say something about the computers, all right? The situation, the computers are used, all right, in the classroom, what are the, uh, challenges or what is the uncertainty or what is the debate okay over you know how best you know to use the computers in the classroom so this is how we can claim the significance and then in step two we can do a kind of you know brief re a lit literature review here which means you know introducing and reviewing items of previous research in the area okay for example you know you refer to some scholars, okay, or some previous researchers, okay, who report this and that, all right, you can include, you know, some keywords like suggest, all right, or argue, all right, okay, so you can refer, you know, to this example later. And then in move two, you know, when we establish a niche or the rationale of the study, so in the first step, you know, for this move, you just justify the research topic. So here, you know, we should indicate the gap, all right, you know, in uh, conducting the research, okay? You can raise some questions, you can extend some knowledge, okay? Related to the field. This is an example, right? So you refer to the arguments, all right? And then you say that uh, what the paper does, right? The paper 
also argues that the educational implications of a sociocultural analysis go further. So this is, you know, the niche okay, that you establish right, in this study, and you can explain more about that. And then in step two as well, right, you can justify the research paradigm, which is defending the choice of approach and the critical framework. So you can talk about the approach, okay, what is the approach used, right, in your study, like this is a sociocultural approach based on the claim that education is essentially a discursive process, right? And you can also talk about another argument, and it's also argued that computers can be used most effectively as a resource for group work and for the support for, uh, of the teaching and learning of language skills. Okay, so this is you know, where we could justify our research paradigm and the choice of the approach. And then in move three, right, we try to occupy the niche so in step one, you know, under move three, right, we present the aim and scope of current research by outlining purposes, methodology, stating parameters of your research. Okay, so you can say something like, you know, this study develops a kind of strategy, and the strategy here is based upon, you know, which theory. Okay. This is, you know, a sample introduction. So when you introduce, okay, the uh, main concept, right, or the main theoretical concepts, you know, of your study, then you can refer to the research question. Okay, so here uh, you can see the samples of research questions, okay, regarding the topic of the use of computers, you know, in the classroom. And then you can move on, right, you know, to the next section, you know, by talking about uh, how, right, uh, the, the project, okay, was funded, how the project, you know, was uh, supported financially, all right, so you just provide all the details about, you know, the project, and then the research questions, right, you know, are presented below. Okay, so here, this is an example, you know, where there are four, right, uh, four research questions, and there are the key, key words here, right, in, in, in each research question. And then in step two, Right, we provide a definition of the key terms. Okay, for example, you know, you can define the term exploratory talk. What does it mean, right, in your study? Okay, so here, you know, when we provide, you know, the definition of key terms, we should operationalize, okay, the terms. That means, you know, what does the term mean in your study? Okay, so in this particular case, what does exploratory talk mean, all right, in this particular research study in the context? And then in step three outline, okay, so you indicate the structure of the research article. Like, so you say the first part of the paper, that's what, the second part of the paper, that's what. Okay, so it's like, you know, the outline for the whole research paper. And then the second uh, chapter, right? Usually it's the second chapter, right? In the uh, research article here, which is literature review. So what does a literature review do? Okay, usually, you know, here, you know, we try to present Okay, the information from the textbooks, okay, from scholarly articles or from any article, uh, any other sources relevant to the particular issue. Okay, and so here, you know, we present an area of research or theory. And we should also, okay, provide a summary and critical review, you know, of those works. So we don't just summarize the works, but we should also uh, do the critical analysis of those works, all right? showing the balanced views, you know, of uh, each topic. That means, you know, you should not present only the good side, but should also, you know, present the negative side or some limitations regarding each concept or, you know, each research methodology, right, in the previous studies. And so literature reviews are designed to first, you know, provide an overview of sources you have explored, okay, while researching a particular topic. And here, you know, you should let your readers, okay, know, right, how you can uh, make, you know, your uh, study, all right, become larger in the field, right, how, how you can broaden or, like, you know, how can you generalize, okay, the, uh, the, the findings, you know, from your study, you know, to the larger field of study later. So a literature review may consist of simply a summary of key sources, but usually in the social sciences, a literature review usually has an organizational pattern and combines both summary and analysis or synthesis, 
Okay, so as I mentioned, right, we should provide, you know, the critical analysis, right, you know, of uh, what we have reviewed, okay. So again, what are the purposes of literature review, all right? So usually, you know, literature, literature review, right, would help us, you know, place each work in the context of its contribution to understanding the research problem being studied. So that means, you know, uh, we should then uh, present, okay, the major information, okay, regarding the concepts related to our study, but then in the context, right, of its contribution, okay, so that the reader can understand the research problem or the problem statement in your study. And literature review also reviews any gaps that exist in the literature, because normally in social sciences or humanities, we tend not to repeat okay, any research study. So what are the gaps, all right, that exist, you know, in the literature? This is, you know, what we should review here, okay, before we explain the methodology. And we should locate our own research within the context of existing literature. This is a very important part because the reader, you know, would need to know what the context of our research is. So here, it should not be too broad or too specific. So now when we analyze, okay, the structure of a literature review, okay, in terms of moves, right? The first move is the, an overview of the subject, issue, or theory under consideration, a general one, general move, right? And then move to present the division of works under review into themes or categories like works that support a particular position or those against, those offering alternative approaches entirely. So that means, again, right, you show the uh, balance view, okay? for each theme and categories. And in move three, okay, there should be some explanation of how each work is similar to or how it differs from the others, okay, making some comparison. And then in move four, right, you give the conclusions on which pieces are best considered in their argument, okay, which are most convincing of their opinions and make the greatest contribution to the understanding and development of their area of research. So there are four moves here, right, in the digital review. Okay, and then the next section of a research article is the methodology. Okay, so here, you know, we should introduce the overall methodological approach for investigating our research problem. That means, you know, how, okay, we conduct the research, okay, to answer the research question we present in the introduction. And maybe we also answer the question about, you know, the, uh, the methods, okay, whether, you know, our research method is qualitative, quantitative, or mixed methods. And is it action research or case study or what? So the methodology then should describe the specific methods of data collection you're going to use, like survey or experimental research. Okay, you should explain this clearly here in this section. So uh, when you explain how you analyze your results then, all right, this is related to the methodology. Okay, so you should also explain whether you use any statistical analysis, you know, in quantitative analysis, or did you use any specific theoretical perspective to help you analyze the text or explain observed behaviors? Any theoretical perspective you use here? Or you need to also describe how you obtain an accurate assessment of the relationships, pattern, trends, distribution, possible contradictions found in the data. Okay, so all of this, you know, would make the explanation of the methodology, okay, as vivid as possible. Okay, so the, in the methodology, then we should provide the background and the rationale, you know, for methodologies that are unfamiliar for your readers. So if you anticipate that there's something not familiar to the readers, then you should provide the background and explain, okay, the rationale, you know, as clearly as you can. At the same time, you should also provide a justification for the subject selection, the selection of the participants and the sampling procedure. This is important, okay, in terms of, you know, the validity of your research study. This is a sample method section. So, you know, when we start, you know, with the first move, okay, we locate the methods within an overall approach to research, okay? So in this example, you see that, you know, the writer uh, explains, okay, how the study uh, was conducted, okay, what the study, uh, what did the study adopt, right, in terms of, you know, the research method or the research paradigm. 
And then it moved to the rationale, right? So here the writer will argue for the choice of methods. Okay, so for example here, all right, from using video recordings of group of children talking together while doing shared reasoning test made. Okay, from this point to Raven's progressive matrices when used with individuals have been shown to correlate closely to educational achievement. Okay, so that means here, all right, the choice of methods, you know, is argued for, right? Justify, it is justified, you know, logically and convincingly. And then in move three, the description. So here, you know, we should provide details on how, right, the subjects, data and procedures, you know, are conducted, okay? So for example, right, a reasoning test, all right, was given to both a target class and a control class. The target class, you know, is the experimental class, right? Divided up into groups of three, okay? When, how, how many groups are there, right? So this is, you know, what you need to describe, you know, in detail in terms of data and procedure. Okay, now the next section is the result section. All right, so in the result section, then we provide the data that are critical to answering the research question. So now you have the data, okay, and you analyze the data and then you interpret the data. So usually the content of result section includes the first move. This is an introductory context for understanding the results by restating the research problem underpinning your study. Okay, so you start off you know, with the introduc introductory context, okay, the general explanation of the context again. And then in move two, all right, you can summarize the key findings, all right, arrange in logical sequence, okay, so that you can follow, okay, your methodological, uh, methodological section. And then in the next step, right, you should include the non-textual elements like, you know, figures, chart photos, map tables to illustrate the key findings. So of course, you know, we need to accompany, right, the textual explanation, okay, with the visual aids. And also, you know, there should be a systematic description of your results, highlighting for the reader observations that are most relevant to the topic under investigation. Okay, so the results, you know, should be described, you know, systematically, right, with, you know, uh, the observations, right, highlighted, okay, for any relevant information. And the use of the past tense, right, when referring to your result, this is important. Normally, you know, when we present, you know, what was done, okay, we use the past tense. And the length of the result section is guided by the amount and types of data to be reported. So actually, there is no exact or determine length of results, okay? But this is determined, okay, by the amount and types of data to be reported. So focus only on findings that are important and relevant, okay, to addressing the research question. The next section is the discussion section. This is, you know, quite a challenging section because this is where you try to show the interpretation of the findings, okay? What do the findings, what do the results mean? Okay, in terms of theories and previous study. So this section is often considered the most important part of your research paper because it's where you most effectively demonstrate your ability as a researcher, right? You need to show your understanding, okay, of uh, the data interpretation as a researcher. So here, right, you should show how you can think critically about an issue. You should also uh, show how you can develop creative solutions to problem based on a logical synthesis of the findings. And you should be able to formulate a deeper, more profound understanding of uh, the research problem under investigation. So this is not an easy part to write. So, you know, in the discussion, we should present the underlying, underlying uh, meaning of your research, and we should note possible implications in other areas of study as well. And we should also explore possible improvements that can be made in order to further develop the concern of the research. Okay, so apart from presenting the result, you should also present other issues related to the results. Okay, and so it's something to do with you know the implications or you know the interpretation you know of the findings for maybe future improvements. And in this section, we should also highlight the importance of our study how it may be able to contribute to and or fill existing gaps in the field. So that means here you go back, right, you know, to the literature review section. 
And here, you know, we can engage our reader in thinking critically about issues based on the evidence-based interpretation of findings. So, you know, when we present the uh, clear logical interpretation of the findings, then we could engage the reader in thinking critically about the issue that we are presenting as well. And this is, you know, very important as this is now empirical, right? This is from empirical data. So for the organization and structure of the discussion section. So first, you know, think of your discussion as an inverted pyramid so that, you know, you can organize the discussion from the general to the specific and you link your ideas. You should link your, your, your findings, okay, to the literature, then to the theory and then to practice. So here, right, we can use the same key terms or we can use the narrative style or we can use, you know, the verb tense, you know, which is present tense normally. All right, that you know we use when describing the research problem in the introduction. And for you know the discussion, we should begin by briefly restating the research problem you were investigating and then answer all the research questions underpinning the problem that you posed in the introduction. So that means here you can see the coherence, right? The link you know, between earlier chapters you know, with uh, the later chapters. And also in the discussion, we should describe the patterns, the principle, the relationships shown by major findings and place them in proper perspective. So after you do, you know, the careful analysis, all right, of the data, you have done, you know, the uh, clear interpretation of the data, you should come up with, you know, some patterns or principles or relationships, okay, that you can derive, you know, from the major findings. So the sequence of the information here is important as well. So first you should state the answer and then relevant results. And then you can cite the work of the other. So here, you know, you should uh, cite, okay, the work of the previous uh, researchers, right? Or, you know, previous studies so that, you know, we can see the similarities or differences, you know, between your findings, all right, and earlier findings. And so you refer the reader to a figure or table sometimes, okay, to help enhance the interpretation of the data. And so the order of interpreting each major finding should be in the same order as they were described in your results section, so that you know it, it would be easier for the reader to follow. Okay, so the major findings you know should be presented in a particular order. Normally, you know, the major findings, you know, should be presented, you know, in accordance with the research questions. Okay, so they should be presented in that order, the order of research questions. And then, you know, when you discuss the major findings, you should also do that, all right, in accordance with, you know, the findings presented in the research, in the research results section. Now we come to the conclusion section. So a well-written conclusion would provide you with important opportunities to demonstrate to the reader your overall understanding of the research problem. And usually this includes first presenting the last word on the issues you raised in your paper, the final thoughts, right? The food for thought that you can provide for the reader. And then you can summarize your thoughts, right? You can convey the larger significance of your study now. You see that, you know, from uh, the more general information in the introduction to the more specific section, right? In the literature review, in the method section, in the result section, in the discussion section. Now, in the conclusion section, we tend, you know, to broaden or generalize, you know, the data, okay, to the larger significance of the study. And then we demonstrate the importance of your ideas here. And we also introduce the possible new or expanded ways of thinking about a research problem, okay? So this is something more general so that, you know, uh, we can make some generalizations about our findings, you know, to the larger context. There are some general rules, you know, for conclusion. So, you know, when we write a conclusion first, you know, we should state our conclusions in clear, simple language, and we should state how our findings differ or support those of others and why. Okay, make some comparisons, you know, of our findings, you know, with earlier findings. And we should not simply reiterate or repeat our findings or the discussion, but you know, we should provide a synthesis of arguments presented in the paper to show how these converge to address the research problem or study objectives. Okay, so that you know we can round off the paper, okay, in a more convincing way, right? In a more insightful way. 
And here in the conclusion, you know, we should indicate opportunities, you know, for future research as well. You can talk about the recommendations for future research and we can highlight some areas, you know, for further studies to give the reader some idea about the evidence that we have, all right, in terms of, you know, the in-depth awareness of the research problem. Okay, this is an example. Okay, so in the first move of conclusion, we can refer back to the aims of the research. Okay, so step one and the move one is the reiteration of the aims. Okay, for example, you know, when we say the research described in this paper confirms the three hypotheses set out in the introduction. All right, another example, right? We can say that, you know, this research is significant because there is a need for EAL writing research to attend to the often ignored development of student language of attitudinal meanings, blah, blah, blah. All right, so this is kind of, you know, uh, the general idea, right? The general significance, you know, of the research study. And in step two, okay, we can confirm or disconfirm the hypothesis. So we can say something like the result indicate that, you know, coaching exploratory talk leads to improved group problem solving. All right, and then you can explain a bit more here. Okay, so you say whether uh, the results, you know, have confirmed or disconfirmed the hypothesis, right, that you propose, you know, in introduction. Move to, you can also interpret, okay, the findings again, but now briefly, okay. Oh, sorry, this is the discussion part, right? So that means, you know, you can interpret the data and present the interpretation, right, in several steps. So the first step is the general insignificance, okay? For example, you know, when you say the result obtained do support the socio-cultural view that, okay, and then you explain. And then in step two, you can explain how the findings, okay, contribute to the knowledge, okay? So you can say something like they also lend support to the argument put forward in blah, 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 that reason can be described in terms of structuring ground rules and so on. Okay, so now you can uh, explain more broadly, right, about, you know, uh, the findings, how do they support the theory. And then for move three, right, we explain. Okay, so here, you know, we explain the finding, for example, the finding that children with the lowest initial scores on the individual reasoning test improve their score much more significantly after coaching in expert to talk than high scoring children was unexpected. This is something that you did not expect to find, right, you know, in your analysis. So this is, you know, what you can also explain. And so you can also further say that or oh, this finding suggests that, okay, so what is your explanation about this? Okay, what, what, what can we explain about the phenomenon? This is interesting part. And then in move four, we can do what we call problematizing. So for example, you know, when we say in interpreting these findings, it must be remembered that higher score on reasoning tests do not imply an increase in general intelligence the score on this test measure primarily the children's ability to do this kind of test. That means, you know, you uh, talk about some problems, okay, but then you will present, you know, the solution later. So, you know, the solution, you know, can be presented through the implication for practice in move five. So you can say, oh, this paper suggests one way in which new technology could be used to help with the coaching and support of this core practice. This is an example for the implication. And finally, in most six writer recommendations, you can say that like the implications of this study are such that they indicate a need for further research, both to confirm these findings and to investigate if the same approach can be applied to different areas of the curriculum. You can see that, you know, when we write the uh, conclusion, right, again, right, the information becomes broader and broader, okay, to the wider context. Another example here. Okay, you can say it's something like research is needed to investigate multimodal perspective extending current applications of the appraisal framework in developing EAL students verbal comprehension and expression of evaluative meaning in curriculum areas to content and language integrated learning. Okay, this is another example about, you know, uh, the CLIO, right, approach, you know, to teaching, language teaching, right, and so this is what you can say in a general manner, okay, about the research on Clue. Okay, so now let me talk about, you know, some common mistakes, you know, in uh, manuscript that we prepare, okay, 
for a journal. Okay, so after you know we finish the whole research article, maybe we need to prepare a manuscript, okay, to be submitted to a journal. So first of all, all right, the first common mistake is that the research question is not specified. So make sure that you know we specify the research question as clearly as we can. So what is or what are the research question, right? And then the stated aim of the paper is tautological. Like, you know, when we say something like the aim of the paper is to describe what we did. This is tautological, it's like it's circular, right? It doesn't say anything else, all right? Or sometimes it's vague, like, you know, we explore issues related to X, so, you know, try to avoid, okay, the statement which uh, presents, you know, the aim of the paper in, in, a, in a way which is too broad. And the structure of the paper is chaotic. That means, you know, uh, for example, the methods I described, you know, in the results section, okay, that means, you know, we, we need to make sure that we structure or organize our paper, okay, very systematically and logically. The manuscript does not follow the journal instruction for others. So that means, you know, before you prepare the manuscript, make sure that you read the instructions in the journal as carefully as you can so that, you know, you can prepare the manuscript appropriately. <laughs> And sometimes the paper much exceed the maximum number of words allowed. So now, right, usually uh, each journal would uh, specify the maximum number of words allowed, you know, for each manuscript. And so, you know, when you write, do not exceed the number. Another thing is the introduction is an extensive review of the literature. So do not get confused, right? So you should uh, explain uh, the literature or, you know, review the literature more extensively, you know, in the section for literature review. So the in introduction, then you should present the problem, all right? Uh, first, you know, generally, more broadly and later, right, you provide a niche, okay, for your research context. But do not do the extensive literature review, you know, in this section. The methods, interventions, and instruments are not described in sufficient detail. Okay, so this is, you know, what you need to do, right, in the manuscript, okay, explain the methods, the interventions and instrument as clearly as you can. The results then are reported selectively, like, you know, percentages without frequency, the p-values without measures of effect. So that means, you know, uh, when, when the results are reported, okay, make sure that, you know, they are reported uh, completely, okay, so that, you know, the reader can understand the results. And the same results appear both in the table and in the text. That means when we present uh, the table, all right, make sure that you know you present only the major findings, and then in the text you just interpret the data in the table. Don't just you know repeat the information in the table. The detailed tables are provided for results that do not relate to the main research question. So avoid presenting all the detailed tables. Put the detailed tables maybe in the appendix. In the introduction and discussion, key arguments are not backed up by appropriate references. So this is also important when you write the introduction or when you write the discussion, you need to also back up right, the arguments with some references. Okay, do not just write them uh, on your own or out of your own imagination. Most or all references are out of date and cannot be accessed by most readers. So we need to ensure right, that you know, the references References, you know, are quite up to date, okay, and they should be accessed, all right, accessible, right, you know, to most reader now online, of course. The discussion does not provide an answer to the research question. So let me you know uh, when we write a discussion section, which is, you know, the most challenging part. Sometimes we just repeat the results section, which is not appropriate. But you know, we should provide a clear interpretation of the findings so that you know we can answer or address the research question, you know, more clearly and appropriately. And sometimes the discussion overstate the implications of the results and does not acknowledge the limitations of the study. We should <clears throat> present the limitations of the study so that, you know, we can show our awareness, right? We know that, you know, our study is not perfect and how imperfect is it, okay? And do not make an overclaim of the impl implications of the results. And the paper is written in poor English. This is important. If you uh, write in poor English, then it's very, very likely, right, that the manuscript, you know, be rejected 
almost immediately. And this is what we call death rejection. Okay, so before I finish my uh, presentation, I would like to talk about uh, the journal. Okay, this is a journal published by my institute, right? The Language Institute of Thomas Art University, and it's a score bus index journal. Okay, so let me uh, can lead you to the journal. This is the journal website. Okay, so LEARN stands for Language Education and Acquisition Research Network. And you know, we welcome, right, uh, manuscripts, right, on a wide range of topics, okay, including, for example, okay, second so of foreign language acquisition and education, okay, language testing and assessment, ESP, EAP, all right, English as a lingua franca, okay, or any field related to applied linguistic, right, and so on, all right, and so because now, you know, it's Scopus Index, so it should be. Uh, useful for you, you know, if you have uh, an article published, you know, in, uh, in in this kind of journal, all right, so so that, you know, your article, you know, will be well accepted or acknowledged, you know, by readers in the field. Okay. So now, okay, so this has come to the end of my talk today. If you have any questions, I would be happy, you know, to answer. Thanks very much, Dr. Trang, uh, for this you know, wonderful presentation. It was, uh, you know, useful for our research scholars and, you know, academicians. So, yeah, now the floor is open for questions. If you have any questions, you can post in, in them in the chat box. So yeah, uh, you know, let me model to the chat box. Uh, one of the question uh, from Hamza Siddiqui, she says, you know, related to theories, is it necessary to apply a theory to carry out uh, your article? Sorry, can you repeat that? We need to apply. Can you hear me that? Can you hear yes. me? Yeah, yeah, but not. So, not... Uh, yeah, yeah. Is it, is it necessary to uh, apply a theory to carry out article? Oh, to apply? Uh, no, we can just, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, you mean in terms of funding, right? Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, sometimes, you know, uh, if, if uh, there are grants, research grants available, right, it would be useful, right, you know, if you have research grants, you know, to help you, right, you know, uh, conduct the study and then write a research article. But normally, sometimes, you know, uh, we, we don't, we don't need the funding. We can, you know, conduct research and then, you know, we can just uh, write a manuscript and, you know, uh, submit it, you know, to a journal. Okay, so uh, it's more about theory, I think, uh, not funding. It's about what, sorry? It's about theory, theory. Uh, theoretical framework. The, uh, theoretical framework? Yeah. Oh, when we so read, it, so you, you mean, you know, when we write a research article, do we need to apply any theories, right? Yep, yep. Uh, uh, no, okay, so it depends on which type of research article we are writing. So if, you know, we want to write a research article, which is more like theory based, then, you know, we can apply some theories. Otherwise, you know, you can just write maybe a research article based on our experience. So maybe it's more like you know action research paper, okay. okay. But 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 of course you know so that you know our manuscript or our paper can be published, all right. Uh, if we have some theories to back up, it would be a lot easier. But you know of course you know for like you know for for teacher development in general, if you want to just share, okay, what you do, all right, what you have done maybe in your classroom. Okay, any practices, you know, that you find interesting or useful for your students, you can just, you know, write a research article, write an article, I would say article, maybe not research article. All right, so that, you know, you can share it, you know, with other teachers that is possible, but maybe if you don't expect, you know, to publish it in any academic journal, that's fine. But there might be, you know, some journals, uh, which accept, okay, papers, right, on this kind of uh, paper, like, you know, the, the the paper, you know, which in which you know we share our experience. Mm -hmm. 
that's also possible. Okay, so there's another question from Raza. She asked, uh, let me find the question. My question is, my research is qualitative and I'm exploring the attitudes of people towards Punjabi. Punjabi is a local language here in Pakistan. So, mm -hmm. you know, will 26 in-depth interviews be enough? I want the paper to be published in an impactful journal. Mm -hmm. So she's asking, uh, you know, for this uh, study, will 26 in-depth interviews will be, you know, enough? Uh, sorry, I, I don't understand your question. Maybe could you, uh, could, you, could, you, could you type the question? Could you, uh, could, yep, uh, it's, it's in the chat box. Could you monitor the chat box? Mm. Okay. Uh, which one? So now I'm on the From chat. Monaza. Monaza, can you copy and paste your question again so that he can easily find it? Okay. Who was the person you know who asked the question? Uh, well, there's another, another question. We can go to uh, the this. What are the misconceptions and mistakes uh, that may occur during a genre based approach? I can ask the question directly if you want. Okay. Yep, yep, sure. Go, go. Okay, so. Go Yes, doctor. Oh. I was asking, uh, my research is qualitative and I'm trying to find out the attitude uh, towards Punjabi language. Oh. So uh, will 26 interviews be enough or should I aim for more? Like maybe 26? Yeah, in-depth interviews. In-depth yeah. interviews. Okay, you mean yeah. 26 interviews? Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. Uh, to me, Right, 26 interviews, you know, are okay enough. Or sometimes, you know, 26, you know, could be more than enough. Uh, because, you know, normally, you know, when we do the interviews, right, in-depth interviews, right, uh, when we do the qualitative analysis, right, you know, which would uh, need us, you know, to do the uh, kind of uh, thematization, right, the content analysis, that would be hard work, you know, for us. So maybe, 26 is, of course, you know, more than enough. And so if you can reduce the number, you know, to just to 10, right, interviewees, that may be uh, feasible, right? And, you know, in terms of in-depth analysis, right? So that, you know, when, when we want to get the profile information, the fewer interviewees, you know, would be better. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a question, please? Yes, please. Can I ask one question? Um, Based on okay. my, uh, yes. Can I ask mm -hmm. one question? Uh, can you hear me? Can you, can I yeah, yeah. ask one? Yes, I'm doing a research, uh, of course, your analysis, uh, uh -huh. and I, I'm, I'm finding it in writing a literature review. Uh, in that uh, session, uh, I, I, I'm quite okay in writing the theoretical framework, and I, mm -hmm. I find it challenging to cover uh, all the things and which kind of uh, things uh, should I uh, write a review. And I think that the theoret only theoretical framework is not enough. So which kind of the things uh, should I write in that literature review? I find it challenging and I, I don't know that uh, uh, how can I say that, uh, the history of the genres. So, and I find it difficult to, to be selected, which facts should I select or which is not just like that. So is there any suggestion for that? You mean the themes? Uh, yes, the themes to put in that literature review. To put in the literature review. Okay. So I, I think that maybe, you know, you need to uh, know, right? You know, what you want to, do research on, right? And then what are the concepts, the major concepts, right? Which are related, you know, to uh, your study. And so, so that, you know, you don't have to write about everything, right? You don't review all the topics, but then, you know, choose only the topics, you know, which are relevant, okay, to your study. 
So mm -hmm. that means what, like, you know, what, what are the key terms or the key concepts that you put in the title? What are the key terms or concepts that you put in the research questions? Okay, make sure that, you know, you review those terms. And then what, what theories, you know, underpinning, underpin, sorry, underpin those terms, all right? And just review them. But, you know, do not review all of them. It would be, you know, a waste of your time. Oh, yeah. So, um, do you like to that in writing like uh, the key terms and the key approaches to that, uh, yes. like that? Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, right. Just, thank you so, very much. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes. Can I ask? Oh, go on. Yes. Yes. Uh, there is a big guest confusion here, uh, particularly in our context, uh, in the differences be between or difference between thesis statement and statement of the problem, and also limitation and delimitations mm -hmm. of the study. Can you please uh, uh, tell us about these so that uh, the confusion may be avoided in future? Okay. So, uh, problem of statement, right, is uh, the statement about okay the problem regarding you know your research what what problem you know did you discover okay regarding your research context so that means you know here you explain okay what is the problem like you know maybe in the classroom something is lacking okay what are the problems you know regarding your students uh, learning behavior or something like this so that's a problem of uh, the, the statement of a problem but and then you know in the limitations of the study normally you know we talk about what we cannot do all right, you know, in the in the study, okay, what we cannot do, what are limit, what are the limitations? Like maybe uh, you talk about uh, the research method that you will that you will use, right? You know, in your study. So that means, like, you know, maybe in in, in your particular context, all right, uh, what you can do is just you know to uh, collect the data only from this particular school. All right, because, okay, this is a limitation, right? That means, you know, you cannot uh, collect the data, you know, from all the schools, you know, in the region, right? And so the delimitation, sometimes I think, you know, this section is optional. The delimitation is more like the scope. So that means, you know, what you can do, all right, to solve the problem in the limitations, all right? So that means, you know, limitation is like, you know, what, what you cannot do, all right? And then in the delimitations, it's like what you can do. Okay, concerning, you know, your research methodology. But, but now, so the first part that was differences between uh, the thesis statement and statement of the problem. Yes, statement of the problem was explained very well. So what about thesis statement in a uh, majority of the study, uh, studies we see uh, thesis statement rather than the statement of the problem. So is there any hmm. difference between uh, these two or, uh, or they are used alternatively? Or they can okay. be used alternatively. So you should, yeah. Usually in a research article, right, we use the term uh, statement of the problem, all right, because you know there should be a problem that we have uh, discovered and something that we want to address. Okay, regarding the problem, at least this statement, you know, is more like an argument. So uh, if we write an essay, for example, an academic essay, then you know we refer to an a thesis statement, right, as the statement of Topic the main statement regarding the topic, right, of your essay, for example. So, you know, this is, statement is not a term that is normally used, you know, for research writing. For research writing, then we use a problem statement or statement of a problem. And then we post the research questions, right? And then what are the research questions, uh, what, what are the methodologies that we can use, you know, to collect the data, to analyze the data, to answer the research questions. So that's why, you know, we, we formulate some research question and, and hypothesis, you know, in, in, a, in a research study, right? Because, you know, that's related to the statement of problem. So this is statement is just like kind of, you know, very general, general term, you know, for essay writing, or, you know, when you want to present any argument in, in, in a more general way, but not from the perspective of research. Thanks very Can much. I ask a it was uh, very insightful for you. Uh, you know, uh, due to time limits, we are over. Uh, you know, one hour, and uh, you know, uh, we'll have to close. But we appreciate your uh, presence here, and we appreciate all the participation from our worthy participants. So yeah, this recording will be made available uh, on 
uh, teacher development webinars youtube channel later this evening you can follow our social media channels for uh, future webinars we appreciate uh, your presence and participation and uh, let me remind you that covid-19 cases uh, have been on rise in pakistan so please uh, keep wearing masks practice physical distancing and don't forget social solidarity be safe guys i'll take Thank your you. leave take care bye bye